Psalm 89, verse 14. And let me say in advance that we will be looking at a topic or subject of justice. In particular, we will be answering the question, what is justice? And in fact, what is God's justice? Verse 14, Psalm 89 and verse 14. In fact, let us read from this uh, 13. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. So we'll be looking at that first word there in verse 14, which is in my Bible, KJV, justice. As some of you who have justice and righteousness are the foundation of thy throne. So uh, NIV is likely to render like that, KJV doesn't render it like that. I'll pick up the NIV version because it includes the idea of the fact that righteousness and justice, these two put together, are the foundation of God's throne. Now, um, I, I want to assume this morning that the word justice, many of us here have heard about it. In fact, probably oftentimes have used it. In fact, whatever the definition or meaning you can attach to that word justice, I can very well illustrate it in the life of almost everyone here. When you do sit for an exam, oftentimes the examiner prepares the marking key and your answers are gauged, scaled against the marking key. So if the questions are five, each one of them 20 marks, you have 100 out of five questions that is the total marks. If you get 89, for example, out of Hundred, your lecturer or your teacher will give you 89 over 100. Now, the teacher is doing that because you have merited the 89 marks. In other words, you deserve to be given 89 out of 100. Now, what the teacher or examiner is doing is that he's being fair with you who has sat the exam. And indeed, we can ask a question. What would you say if you have gotten 80 out of 100 and then the teacher decides that everyone in class, even those who have failed, are going to be given 80? Yourself? and everyone else who hasn't gotten 80, he decides or she decides that you will be given 80 out of 100. Would that be fair? Is that fair? Those who have failed and who haven't failed, one of them given the equal mark? Is that fair? It is not fair. In other words, the teacher is unjust. The teacher or lecturer is not exercising justice in giving the marks, having marked the exam. So when we are saying that uh, we are looking today at justice according to verse 14 of Psalm 89, and there specifically justice is being attributed to God, we are saying, though we will be talking about the justice of God, the idea of justice is not 
very far from you. In fact, you have experienced either justice or the opposite, which is injustice. What is justice? Simply fairness for our young ones. So each time the young ones you are complaining to dad or mom and you are saying, look mom, this is not fair. You are simply saying, mom, you are not just. You are unjust. You are practicing injustice. Now let's look together at verse 14. Let's look together and pay attention to several words there. Verse 14, justice, I will be coming back to that shortly, and righteousness, a word that is coming from being right, that is, there is a standard which we are using to gauge everything else, the right standard, not a wrong one. Those meeting that right standard are righteous in that sense. The psalmist is saying, righteousness and judgment, these two characteristics or qualities make up the foundation of God's throne. They anchor God's throne. They support God's throne. Now, what is the throne? Again, this should be familiar at least in our imagination. We might not need or know the exact definition, but simply that wherever this word throne is used, two ideas come up front. What are these ideas? There is a king on the throne. What does a king do? He or she rules if she is a queen. That's the first idea that comes whenever this word throne pops up, wherever it pops up. The second idea is that whoever is on that throne, that ju judgment seat, oftentimes is himself or herself a judge. So when the psalmist is saying justice and judgment or righteousness are the foundation of your throne, the psalmist has in mind that God in ruling and governing his creatures exercises justice and that that is the pillar, it is the foundation, it is what supports his kingship or his leadership and governance. So that taken the way it is this verse, we are saying God is a king on the throne. He is governing his creatures. In so doing, God exercises justice. Put differently, God is just in doing what? In governing his creatures. Now let me I confess and agree with you that there is a little bit more other issues connected with God's justice. For today, we will only concentrate on how God administers justice in particular to you and me. So therefore, if we are to define what justice is for those of you who are writing, simply put, we will be saying when this word pops up, in particular, not so much the justice in the world, but in particular in the Bible, and for you and me as Christians, Justice, the idea embedded in there is that there is the giving and the rendering to the person what is their due. 
In other words, what are the benefits? What are the punishments? And that is with regard to the law of God. Now, God has been doing this, by the way, all the way back in Genesis. God has exercised over man leadership and governance by being just. And he has done that by providing a law. In that law, we have rewards for doing what is right and punishment for doing what is wrong and what is not right. Let's turn together to Genesis. Let's see that in fact this was what was embedded in the life between God and Adam and his wife before the fall. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. We will read, pick up two verses from here and please take note, we are saying God renders justice through his law and this comes in two ways. Rewards for doing what is right, punishment for disobedience. Chapter 2 of Genesis and verse um, 17, verse 17, in fact verse 16, God and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Observe please that this was a commandment. God gave a law to Adam. What is the prescription? That of every tree of the garden they were to freely partake, freely eat, freely have it for themselves. That, was what, that is what God did allow. What was the prohibition? What did God say they should not do? Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Please look at the negative there. God is very clear to Adam and Eve. Now this was, was, was given to Adam. What is it? There is a threat. Observe the threat of punishment. What is the threat? <clears throat> in the day that thou eatest thereof, Thou shalt surely die. So on one hand, God allows Adam to partake in a commandment, but at the same time he prohibits. In prohibiting, he accompanies that with a threat. God is going to undertake punishment if there is disobedience. Now look at chapter 3 and verse 22. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Look at that forever in the end there. We don't have it in chapter 2. But here information is added. That that command God had given, there was reward of life attached to the command. Adam and Eve, if they had lived by the terms of the commandment, they were going to enjoy a life with God in perpetuity, forever without end. So observe two things. In God exercising justice, and we are saying in justice, he is rendering, he is giving man 
what man deserves according to God's law, God punishes, God rewards, and this according to his law. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul um, makes a mention very interesting in connection with the law. The law given to Adam was not an evil law. It was not like God was making life difficult for Adam and Eve. The intention behind the law, in fact, is good. It is for the well-being of Adam and later on mankind, you and me. And it's the Apostle Paul who makes us see this. Because in Romans chapter 7 and verse 12, Romans 7 and verse 12, let's turn there, those of you with Bibles, to see what how the Apostle Paul describes the law of God. And this is what he says in this verse. Therefore, verse 12, Romans chapter 12, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. God's law is good, good for you and me. The law of God is not meant to unnecessarily disadvantage you and me. God did not mean that these commandments would be a disadvantage to his creatures. In fact, the law is advantageous to us in many ways. And we can't go into details just now, except to mention that here, the Apostle Paul clearly says the law is holy. The law is good. The law is just. So Adam and Eve, given the law, it was a good law for them. It was for their well-being. However they fell. And God visited them in judgment. And if we read further in chapter 3, you will see that they were banished. They were chased. They were told to leave out of the garden of Eden. God now is exercising justice. How? By ensuring that the threat he gave to Adam, he executes, he carries it out. They did not physically die, but spiritually they were dead. And later on, the Apostle Paul writes and he refers to that event. That through one man, sin entered the world. And death through sin. And we all die. So what happened in the Garden of Eden, God, what he promised, he carried out, he executed. The threat that he had given came upon Adam and Eve in their life. And we are saying God acted justly. He exercised justice. He rendered to Adam and Eve what their act demanded and required. What was it? Immediate expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And we learn, in fact, later that spiritually both of them died. Communication with God was cut. They were no longer in fellowship, sweet fellowship with him. 
We have defined justice and we are saying biblically the idea is that the person is given what is their due according to the law of God. We have said that God's governance for his creatures is supported by justice and righteousness. That is the foundation. But let me add one angle to it. The justice of God is what Abraham appealed to when God was about to reign sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's see, brethren, um, Genesis 18, and just one verse there, in the interest of time, Genesis 18, and verse 25. Just for context sake, let's read the first three verses, 23 to 25. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Verse 24. Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are within? Now, People have taken this to be, you know, Abraham interceding for his nephew, or if you're an African, for his son, Lot, who is in a place that is about to be judged. And Abraham is saying, look, my nephew or my son, if you're an African, is righteous. Are you also going to deal, are you going to punish him? together with the unrighteous if there are only a few listen to what he says in verse 25 that be far from thee to do after this manner to stay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That word right in KJV is shall not the judge of the earth do just? What is Abraham doing here? Abraham is appealing to the justice of God. God, are you going to render? punishment even on the righteous that is contrary to who you are you are a just God you don't punish where punishment is not due I'm sure those of you have read the whole story you will see that Abraham's nephew Lot escaped the punishment in Sodom and Gomorrah. What is the point? The point is that the justice of God is a major doctrine and teaching that you and me ought to know about. And in the instance we have quoted here, Abraham is appealing to the justice of God in the behalf of the righteous in Sodom. And he's saying you are righteous God. You don't just punish. Render punishment where punishment is not due. Surely if there are a few there, will you also destroy them with others? It is inconsistent, Adam is saying, with who you are as a just God. Applying this to Psalm 89, Abraham is simply saying, you govern your world and creatures in justice.
That is the foundation of your throne. You can't do that. There are righteous people there. And God salvaged us. Now, I gave an example of an exam because I wanted all of us to log in, the young and the old. And simply, we are saying, where God's justice is, there is no favoritism, there is no impartiality. In fact, this is to do with salvation. But it brings in that idea that God's justice, in God's justice, there is no favoritism, there is no impartiality. Look at Acts chapter 10, the story of Peter and Cornelius. Then, verse chapter 10 and verse 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive or understand that God is no respecter of persons. Now, it is the conversion of Cornelius who was not from amongst the Jews. An outsider also received Jesus Christ. God is extending salvation, not just to the Jews, but even to others. Now, there was something that was done here. So, in realizing or coming to senses or understanding, Peter describes or ascribes to God that with God, he does not look at the faces. God exercises no partiality. God exercises no favoritism. There is, in other words, equity with God. And his laws equally in them, the laws of God, carry with them equity. They are not cruel to you, but holy. They are not unjust, but God's laws are good. And they are meant for you and for me to abide. So how does God exercise justice? The idea of giving what is due, he does that well, several ways, but here principally through the law. He also does it, for example, through his promises. When God gives a promise, he is faithful to live by it. Now, obviously, we are in a world that is very far from the idea we are discussing. There is unfairness. There is injustice all over. And, of course, we don't have time to go into detail. In fact, the verse we are considering, if you have looked at it closely, there is mercy and truth also in that verse. Except to mention that in opposition to God's justice, which is based on the law of God, there is so much injustice in this world. And I'm very sure some amongst here, or probably many here, have experienced injustice wherein favoritism is exercised against you or people do all kinds of things because they are looking at your face, 
They are looking at your status in society. If it is in Zambia, they will be looking at your tribe. Indeed, and elsewhere, they will be looking. Even your own skin, in other places, it becomes a source of discrimination, dealing unfairly and unjustly against you. That is foreign to God and his justice. Now one idea of God's justice through his laws is that his righteousness becomes known to people. That's why he carries out his justice very strictly. For example, as far as God is concerned, the soul that sins, the Bible says in Ezekiel 18, shall surely die. What is the idea behind anyone that sins and he dies? It's because there is a law which God must observe. And in observing that he must execute. And in executing, man, if he's not found in Christ, will surely die. Oh, brethren and friends, the, this, the, the justice of God is not a small matter at all. As we have noted, this underpins God's very kingship and administration of his governance to man. I've mentioned the idea of a threat oftentimes. God is misrepresented, and that comes oftentimes in two ways. You and me, especially those of you who are Christians, we look at God's law, and in it we see what? We see the threats, and we feel as if we are being pressed. There is something unfair about it. And to those who are not Christians, they look at the law and they fear. Why? Because of guilt. What is guilt? Because of the offense against the law of God. Oh, dear friends, because of God's justice, he has dealt with you and me justly in the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle mentioned this very clearly. And brethren, we need to take not only interest, but very seriously the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. When you hear people talk about Christ dying and the gospel, don't take it lightly because it is in the gospel and in particular in the cross that God deals with mankind justly. In other words, in the cross and those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross escape God's punishment. Now this is what he says in chapter 3 and verse 25. You don't need to turn to this. What does the Bible say? Bible says in verse 24, Romans chapter 3, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, meaning to be one who pleases God through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past 
through the forbearance of God. Christ went to the cross because God had to be the just God in making the punishment for sin on you and me. But in the plan of salvation, God brought in a substitute, Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross. He was dying so that the punishment is not inflicted on you and me. In other words, they were in the mind of God and the plan, he transferred sin from mankind to Jesus Christ and he punished it on the cross. There are several sayings that Christ uttered on the cross. One of those sayings is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What was going on? God forsook his son on account of sin on him. He withdrew as punishment for the sin. And his son recognized the withdrawal, recognized what had happened, such that he could even utter it verbally and audibly to those who were near. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why was Christ forsaken? Sin. Why the sin? Because it must be punished. And Christ took in the punishment and he felt it such that he could cry out to the Father who had withdrawn from him. Oh friends, the New Testament is very clear. But you see, we, this is an opportunity that you and me have to do what? To do what is right. Why? Because a time is coming when, as the Bible puts it, that we shall all appear where? Before the throne of God. And this is what will happen. So then, every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. And we are going to do this on what we have done which is wrong and what we have done which is right. Where will you be? That's the question. On that day, what will be your answer? Remember, you're not going to be appearing before a man like our ministers or our court judges and major streets. This is a God who doesn't need to have a plenty and a respondent. I don't know whether this one is correct. So that he is giving evidence and the other one is defending. No. God knows everything. We are told he has a book in which he has written. So he won't need a witness to convict you of anything. God himself is the witness. What will be your reckoning in that day? We are saying, brethren and friends, God will meet his justice. And the only one who will escape 
is one who is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm sure if you've been coming here, you have heard about Jesus Christ. I'm not the first one to preach and talk about him. But the question is, what have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ? On that day, are you going to endure? They are counting before the Holy God. Oftentimes, because of the sinfulness of our nature, the bell doesn't ring. Even when it rings, it rings in humanistic ways. And what is your response? Some of you are religious. God is love. He is going to understand. He can't after all kill all the people. My friend, God is not like you and me. He wiped an entire people and animals during the flood. He demonstrated during Sodom and Gomorrah that he visits sin and he does so sternly. And by the way, even now, God visits a people. When he mentioned that I, I, in preparing, I consulted why much of what, what I've presented is from AWP, but others agree that God now visits people and nations. And one way in which we ought to observe that God probably is dealing with us in judgment is when many people are laughing injustice and sin. There is no improvement in the moral well-being of the people. Many are lovers of self rather than lovers of God. Many would rather go to places of amusement, sport, you call it entertainment, rather than to be preoccupied with the things of God. When that is happening in your family, in the nation, Take note that probably we would be facing the justice and punishment of God. So, God is not going to wait and judge when Christ will come. He does visit the people. And so you who are Christians, and if there is anything that I have say that I could say I've communicated in application. It's simply this. When there is no movement of the Holy Spirit in the church and people are not being saved, they, they love their positions. They, they, are, they are not in any way threatened by either the preaching or the reading or your personal efforts in encouraging them. It is a cause to pray to God Almighty that we might not be visited in judgment as a people. Because God executes and carries out his threats and is able to withdraw. That is referred to as, you know, when the Holy Spirit 
all leaves us by ourselves. And so we go through the usual motions. We fulfill everything that we think must be fulfilled as children of God. But there is no passion for His glory. We are not disturbed. When we see wantonness amongst our people, when the things of God are increasingly becoming something that is not loved, being speaking to his generation, he says there's been a lot of Bible reading in his time. But it was very clear that that Bible reading has not yielded anything. Because men and women read the Bible, but they have no fear of God. They increased in sinning and offending against God. It's very possible. As an individual, a family, or as a church, indeed as a nation, God could be visiting us in judgment because He is a God of justice and He renders to the people what is due. Oh, friends, let me just close by way of emphasis uh, to those of you who are not Christians. As who have genuinely come to know Jesus Christ by faith in his death, know the preciousness of this Christ. And now that we've moved from death to life. Someone could be sleeping with you, walking with you, living with you. But the truth is that God's wrath no longer remains on all that believe in Jesus. So we know this. And when we are entreating and wooing you and saying, listen, listen, pay attention. There is the world which is taking your attention. There is Satan and all his activities around you. Your very self mitigates against the law of God. Listen, there is Jesus Christ. Friend, you need to pay attention. Why? Because God will certainly come and judge by the man he has appointed, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, friends, Christians, listen to this. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the problems. You know them. The spirit in you is a witness. All I can simply do is to invite you to this promise. God is able to walk with you. And what is the assurance? He did not spare his son. God made him die for your sake. And the Apostle Paul is saying, if God did that, he gave that to you, how can he fail? To be gracious to you in all things. Let us pray together. Our Father, thank you for who you are in yourself, a God who is just, a God who is without injustice, a God who exercises justice fairly without partiality as name. Father, we give thanks for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In him you afflicted. In him, O oh Lord, you punished. For what reason? That men like ourselves will look at Christ and what he has done and listen to the call to believe in him. Why? So that we escape the punishment due to your justice. Lord of our grace, have mercy upon us who have heard this message and be gracious. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. a minute or so. 